Welcome you this afternoon to all of our guest colleagues, our students and staff um, who are here this afternoon. Uh, for some four decades now, an audience such as this uh, has gathered annually to hear a lecture from a prominent scholar or even scholars sometimes in the series of distinguished William James lecturers uh, on uh, religious experience. This year, we have the distinct honor of having Professor John McDermott uh, 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 not, a, not unknown to us here from previous visits and participation in uh, academic <coughs> matters here, uh, from, uh, coming to us from Texas A&M, and it's a pleasure to have him back with us again. Um, so let us say welcome to you especially, John. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have you here again. Uh, in 1968, the William James lectures at the Harvard Divinity School were endowed through the gift of, jo of the John Lindsley Fund. The Lindsley Fund description reads as follows. Mr. Thayer Lindsley's longstanding interest in William James as a teacher and in his religious ideas made it seem appropriate to the trustees of the fund to establish these lectures in honor of William James. The purpose was to have an out outstanding scholar lecture annually on some aspect of the person or work of the great Harvard philosopher for whom the series is named. We're taking advantage of the provision of having more than one scholar speak on a given William James lecture occasion tonight. Because after Professor McDermott's lecture, our own William James specialist, Professor David Lamberth, will respond to the lecture. Uh, and at the end of Professor Lamberth's comments, we're going to open it up uh, for questions uh, from, the, uh, from the audience. And Professor McDermott tells me that he's even brought his chalk so he can use the board if the questions get really tough. So I think we're all set. I think we're all set. Um, my colleague, our Associate Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs, Jane Eidelman Smith, is going to introduce our speaker and our respondent for the evening. So I'm going to turn the program over now and become a member of the audience, and I'm looking forward to it. Good afternoon. It is indeed uh, my pleasure to be able to introduce to you someone that I have just met, but with whom I have corresponded in setting up this afternoon, uh, one of uh, the most distinguished scholars on the area and field of William James in the world, I am told. So uh, we are delighted that he's been able to come and be with us. John McDermott is Distinguished Professor of Philosophy and Humanities at the Texas A&M University, where he is currently a University Regents Professor. He holds an MA in Philosophy from Fordham and a PhD with great distinction from Fordham. And as I can tell, he has functioned with great distinction ever since then. He works in the areas of classical American philosophy, philosophy of culture, literature, and medicine. Dr. McDermott is a recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the National Harbison Award for Gifted Teaching from the Danforth Foundation, the Presidential Professor Award for Teaching Excellence at Texas A&M, the Piper Professor Award for Outstanding Scholarly and Academic Achievement, and so on. Particularly relevant for the purposes of this lecture, he was the co-founder and advisory editor to the 19-volume critical edition of the works of William James, published by Harvard University Press, and general editor of the recently completed 12-volume critical edition of the correspondence of William James, published by the University of Virginia. To the University of Chicago Press, Professor McDermott has edited scholarly editions of the works of William James, John Dewey, and Josiah Royce. He has many other writings. I'm not going to take time to uh, read all of those to you. I'm sure you would rather hear him speak. Uh, it is important to note, I think, that in 2006, a volume of essays was published in celebration of Professor McDermott's own work entitled Experience as Philosophy on the Work of John J. McDermott. He is the founding member and former president of the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy and has been president of the William James Society and the Josiah Royce Society. Please help me say hello and a warm Eastern welcome to our Texan guest, Dr. John J. McDermott, who will speak to us this afternoon on a Jamesian personscape, the fringe as messaging to the sick soul. Dr. McDermott.
So can everyone hear me? I suppose I gotta walk over here. So, I have much to say about William James and Sixth Soul. Consider this uh, something of a landscape and uh, questions and responses. Uh, we can perhaps be more specific. I don't have any answers to these kinds of questions. They're too difficult, but uh, I can respond. When I was very young, I read a book by Sharon Kierkegaard. I opened it up and it said, this book is dedicated to my reader, and Darren Zilma. And I said, this guy's writing this book for me. And I never forgot that. And even though I'm no stranger to the preface of the critique of political economy of Marx, whereby we were all conditioned, institutionally conditioned, or Freud civilization is discontents for the genomic crowd, in which we as individuals, persons, singles, or so on, you know, disappear. I'm not a stranger to any of that. But uh, for a long time, I've clung to James and some of my existentialist friends. Because as you know, lamentably, we only die one person at a time. I'm pleased and privileged to present this centennial lecture on behalf of the memory of William James. That this takes place at Harvard University is quintessentially appropriate, for to speak the name of William James is to speak Harvard. I say this despite the fact that he was very institutionally grouchy during his long term at Harvard, but then he was often grouchy about many other daily incumbrances. I thank the Harvard Divinity School, Dean William Graham, Professor David Lambeth, Karen Gundler, Hudaker, and what could only be a cast of thousands who provided information, arrangements, and solutions. Stellar in this regard is Miss Lori Holter, she of endless patience and good cheer. And I thank all of you who have come to this event honoring the splendid memory of William James. Whatever one thinks of what James thought, there is no doubt he was special. He was very special indeed. I hope that you are comfortable with this sort of talk. I am, and I think William James would have been. For example, he went to the Harvard Young Men's YMCA talk about life is worth living is not a very best piece, but in the middle of that, he talked about the massacre of the Albigensians by the high medieval church. I'm not sure what those young men thought about that, but how about physical phenomena in a private circle on table tipping in a New England town seance? That's another one of his performances. And of course, you, I trust you know that Mrs. Alice L. Gibbons James was a leader of seances. Um, allow me to say that the personal pronoun as used in this presentation is to be taken as representative of the cast of millions whose sickness is at the center of what William James means by the sick soul and is at the center of what James means by possibility. Consequently, when I say I, I mean that as a touchstone for countless others still suffering as a sick soul, low bottom alcoholics. Uh, there are 20 million practicing alcoholics, modestly, four in the family plus the neighborhood, the job, and so on. We're talking 80 to 100 million people who are deeply affected by this. So now I'd like to tell you the napkin story before I start. And this is a follow-up to a story that I tell, it takes too long to tell here, but when I was 16 years old, and I worked in a triage unit at Bellevue Hospital, and I ran into a, a <clears throat> quadruple amputee who had an enormous tumescent gut. Uh, in those days, they just simply lined them up with nice uh, cotton. And there was no medicine of any kind. The burn victims and the cancer people. And I used to take them to church, run errands, make phone calls, buy them gum, and fit them with glasses. And anyway, this guy wanted two cigars, and I had to go get them, and he raised a big fuss that they had to be Puerto Rican cigars. And I had to go all the way up. He was telling them to get them. And, and uh, I mean, my big problem then was acne. And I actually, I had no real understanding what the hell he was up against, but so I gave him cigars. And when he lit the cigars, you know, you've never seen a face like that, just the opposite of when he made the face because I told him I was going to get two of Mel Allen's white owls. He didn't like that. I didn't get it. And I didn't get it until 15 years, 20 years later. 
talking about authenticity, but I really didn't get it. It took a, took a four-seater plane from Sawa to Maya West uh, over the island, and then I got it. There was a psychiatrist and a lecture I gave to national health uh, people. Hopkins, she dro dropped me a note. She said, McDermott, I really liked the cigar man story, but I wasn't really sure I got it. But she said, now I have it because, listen to this. So she wrote this. Quite regularly, our psychiatrist would participate in celebratory occasions for the less fortunate, the egregiously lonesome, and the geriatrically disabled. The occasion in question was a birthday party featuring a luscious and well-appointed chocolate cake festooned with candles representing many, many decades of life. This was for very old ladies and place. A good time was had by all. As the psychiatrist was leaving, the women chimed in unison, thank you for the cake. As the door was about to close, till another voice was heard, one that was jagged and struggling. It came from a very aged woman off to the side with gnawed limbs, severely crumpled posture, cronish like. She raised her arthritic finger and said, forget the cake, thanks for the napkin. I offer my hope that this presentation will provide my listeners with a napkin along the way. From William James Varieties, I believe, he writes, that no so-called philosophy of religion can begin to be an adequate translation of what goes on in the single private person. Incidentally, he says man, so there's no woman in James' stuff, and there's no woman in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, but there are women everywhere, many drunks, and many philosophers. So when we, I give you a quote about man, it's men and women. I just changed this. So the single private person, that's you, that's you, that's me. They haven't, they have, they've never changed the big book. No, I mean, they've, they've, uh, they've made apologies, but no. We're talking about the Bible, man. I mean, we're not gonna change that. <laughs> I am not going to present a traditional philosophical paper on the philosophy of William James. Over the past three decades, such commentaries have increased exponentially such that his thought is no longer circumscribed by wisecracks about the alleged philosophical ineptness of his pragmatism. One thinks here, among others, of the masterful interpretation of James by Gerald Myers and David Lambeth. Certainly one would be hard pressed to write as Margaret Knight did in 1950 in an otherwise cogent treatment of James' psychology to wit. Consequently, though he could never fail to be stimulating, James the philosopher was at best little more than a brilliant and slightly irresponsible amateur. I do the contrary take William James to have upended two millennia of classical epistemology and metaphysics. Although not heretofore designated as such, I hold that analogous to Kant, in radical empiricism we hold a Copernican moment. It remains to be seen whether David Lambeth is prescient in his contention that James's metaphysics of experience, and this is what Lambeth writes, is capable theoretically of comprehending the deep systemic insights into social processes such as those advanced in contemporary studies of gender, race, ethnicity, and class, while at the same time correlating them critically to the more intimate religious and moral interests by which we as human beings are animated. Let us hope he's right about that. Of this, however, I'm confident that if spiritual help is needed, whether it be secular or confessional, the writings of William James constitute, constitute a deep and nutritious reservoir for us. I read James as a pedagogical enabler, one who helps me to read my experiences, especially those which lurk on the fringe, those had as inarticulate, inchoate, vague, and yet ambient all the while. Plato held philosophy to be therapeia, a healing. William James wrote that philosophy bakes no bread, but it does encourage the habit of always seeking an alternative. In a spiritual crisis, only an alternative will work. Here in a variant of religious experience, James marries the wisdom of the noble Jewish tradition of the Teshuvah to the thick terrain of conversion. That is, I come to speak to myself in a different voice, an alternative, if you will. With Heraclitus, I searched out myself, and thereby, and thereby, my name is John, and I am an alcoholic. My name is John, I was a sick soul. In keeping with the diagnosis of William James, I was a sick soul, more I was an exemplar of his divided self. Or put my way, the ongoing process of my selving was rent by a persistent splitting, a radical interior dislocation, 
In short, the suffusing of my person with an abominable loneliness. In a chapter on the sick soul in the classic work of Variety's religious experience, William James introduces us to a raft of persons from stations high and low, famous and unsung. Each of these affected persons are riven with a maddening inner vapor that leaches into every cranny of their person. In the parlance of alcoholism, they were irritable, restless, and discontent. He cites a priest, Father Gautry. I neither perceive nor conceived any longer the existence of happiness or perfection, an abstract heaven over a naked rock. Such was my present abode for eternity. A 19-year-old domestic servant commits suicide. She leaves a note telling us that I'm tired of living, so I'm willing to die. Life may be sweet to some, but death to me is sweeter. And he gives us a startling text from Goethe, anachronistically identical to the Sisyphus of Albert Camus. I will say nothing, writes Goethe in 1824, against the course of my existence. But at bottom, there's the word, bottom, in Goethe, in James, that's the alcohol word. I'm at the bottom. It has been nothing but pain and burden, he writes, Goethe, and I can affirm that during the whole of my 75 years, I have not found four weeks of genuine well-being. It is but the rolling of a rock that must be raised up again forever. This from the same Goethe, whom James cites as a linchpin in his sentiment of rationality in 1879. The inmost nature of the reality is congenial to powers which you possess. How these texts live together in Goethe is not for me to say, but they are synchronous in the life and thought of William James. The streaming from the darkness of the sick soul to the effervescence of the pragmatism is a testament to the possibility of congeniality and the existence of powers to which we have potential access. This stream of experiencing is fed by and is unintelligible without the vertebral strand of radically empirical sensibility, or so I think. A still further and chilly limning of personal despair is found in James's discussion of the spiritual dimension of Tolstoy's inner life. Tolstoy writes that one can live only so long as one is intoxicated, drunk with life, but when one grows sober, one, not, one cannot fail to see that it is all a stupid cheat. More than sober. Dead, James says. Life had been enchanting. It was now flat sober, more than sober. Dead, that part is from James. And not only this, Tolstoy writes, but they have recognized that the very thing which was leading me to despair, the meaningless absurdity of life, is the only contestable accessible to man. Here we are at the bottom, and James covertly in the varieties knows this bottom to have been a dwelling place for him as well. More about this subsequently. Now, perhaps we can glean the full import of the experience of the sick soul if we state it theolog theologically appropriate here in the Divinity School. In a textu textually legitimate paraphrase of Jonathan Edwards, it would be better for us to be born and damned than not to be born at all. For by being born, we enhance the glory of God by our dependence on him. Place that over against James's citation from a patient in a French asylum. Oh, God, what a misfortune to be born. Born like a mushroom, doubtless between an evening in the morning. When I was drifting and then plummeting to my bottom, I would look at the grazing cows with envy. Free of despair, I would say of them. In his remarks on the despair as experienced by John Bunyan, James writes, envy of the placid beasts seems to be a widespread affection in this type of sadness. How did he know that? Problem or trouble? Let me tell you the story of the Polish mathematician. He was arrested, as many were, as you know, in the very dark days behind the curtain, and uh, locked up in a solitary, and they would not give him a pencil or a piece of paper. So he did his work um, recasting, reconnoitering, refiguring, whatever, all these formulas. Oh, no. Many, many years went by, and he was finally released, and he said, in the nick of time, because he had used every relation, every relation, to the point where it was threadbare, and he was beginning to eat his brain. He said, I, I was beginning to eat my brain. And if we are not fed, you see, by the palpable, in this case, 
In this case, it's just a piece of paper. If you're not fed by relational nectaring, okay, then we, right, we suffer from deep inanition. In Irish, a distinction is made between problem and trouble. The first, even if dire, with work and John Dewey's creative intelligence can be resolute. With trouble, there's no way out without punition. The difference between my announcement that I was a sick soul, that I am alcoholic, is instructive here. In the sick soul, the persons introduced by James are suffering without any quarter. He does not discuss relief until the subsequent chapters on conversion. And the major characteristic of conversion is the appearance, the happening of a power transcendent from beyond the personal locale of the malaise, the fright, the despair. He holds that the healing of the divided self comes in consequence of its firmer hold upon religious realities. He does say that this access to a higher power, and that's a term he uses, by the way, and that is where it comes from, by the way. As you know, the founder of A.A. Bill Wilson read the varieties very carefully indeed. He holds that the healing of the divided self comes in consequence of its firmer hold upon religious realities. He does say that this access to a higher power is what conversion signifies in general terms, whether or not we believe that a direct divine operation is needed to bring such a moral change about. You see, that's the line that's not usually right, passed on. It's the first one, the religious realities and the higher power. What's not passed on is that he said it's not necessary you see, to have a uh, direct divine operation. In writing in the case of Stephen H. Bradley, he tells us that possibilities of character character lay disposed in a series of layers or, layers or shells of whose existence we have no premonitory knowledge. One thinks here of James's contention that a possibility is extant, not yet in our present sight. Now returning here to our diagnosis of one kind of sick soul, the clinical low-bottom alcoholic, the received wisdom anointed and judged that person as hopeless, clearly having trouble rather than a problem. Remarkably, in three pages of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, William James, Jung, and Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, gather together to delineate both the hopelessness and the thin, desperate hope that what we have here can become a problem with the chance ever so slight of having a way out. This is a long text from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I'm going to read except to say that Jung tells this fellow that he's licked, that he'll have to go home and get a security guard and the lock and key that there's no hope for him. And uh, his patient said, the, the gates of hell climbed around me. He's in no exception. And then Jung does not cite James directly, but we know he takes us from the varieties. You have to have this extraordinary displacement, replacement, <laughs> and this whole, this whole version, what I call a turn, the Teshuvah, the word Teshuvah in Hebrew, all the way back, my friend. Tim Graham will know all this. It means recovery. That's what it means, recovery. I mean, it's a turn, it's a turn of the heart, I'm not this. Right. And uh, he says that uh, um, there's only possibility. The book, the A, then invokes the varieties by James, stressing the many ways in which the alcoholic sick soul can have the spirit of experience and discover God. And it's here we have the origin of the contentious, conflicted presence of the higher power in most recovery literature, especially Alcoholics Anonymous. It is here also where we have a major obstacle to people uh, entering the program of Alcoholics Anonymous because they cannot abide the higher power. What is not focused on again here is that the, the contentiousness of this generated a compromise made by the founders of AA and reunion step three um, referred to God as we understood him. And then the sotto voce, but very important, a power greater than ourselves, responding to the first step, which is that I'm powerless. And finally, a reference to William James's position that the spiritual experience could be of the educational variety. Now, forebodingly, many alcoholics do not believe in a higher power, nor do many other recovering alcoholics. For many, this is a permanent obstacle to recovery. Consequently, it was assumed that my trouble was indeed irresolute. Returning to James on the sick soul, at the end of a chapter, he shares a document detailing a vastation experience laced with extreme morbidity and imagined terror. And the correspondent, that's actually, we now know James, claims that he would have grown really insane had he not clung to scriptural texts 
like the eternal God is my refuge. Step two in uh, AA is insanity. Uh, that is the thought that you could do the same thing over and have it turn out different. We know this document is autobiographical. We also know that although this event was episodic and not permanently suffusing, James remained depressed for a year subsequent and on February 1st tells us he about touched bottom. On April 30th of 1870, a diary he announces a term. I will go a step further with my will, not only act with it, but believe as well. This turn does not involve a higher power, and yet it was to be the decisive thread that knit together all of James's work for the next 40 years. His belief in what he later famously calls the will to believe is a philosophical bootstrap move, but this contention will enable to set out with the mission from him in his diary, lives shall be built in doing and suffering and creating. From that way of William James, I took a way out of my trouble from which I was told over and over again, there was no way out. And along his weighing, he introduces me to a series of insights helpful to my weighing. And to that James in pedagogy, I now turn. Warnings and messagings for a secular turn. Contrary to conversion experiences of a sick soul, the secular clinical low-bottom alcoholic allegedly has no way out. That is, no cure, no Valhalla, no coming into the clearing once and for all. The best one can do is remission. And the book tells us that we are offered a daily reprieve. Our sobriety depends on our fit spiritual condition, which is a way of saying that we must be vigilant, acutely aware of our vulnerabilities, and must stay in close contact with the community of recovering alcoholics as a power greater than ourselves. Quite simply and directly, we must be fed. A turn is not a spinning top. It needs nutrition. For whence comes that if I'm secular, philosophical naturalist, one who lives only subspecie temporalis? As a sick soul of the alcoholic variety, all dangers are heightened. As a student of William James, personal possibilities are vast and enlivened, as when he tells us that the deepest thing in our nature is this bin and labored, this dumb region of the heart in which we dwell along with our willingnesses and unwillingnesses, our faiths and our fears. For practicing alcoholics, dwelling alone had no such possibilities, for we faced what James calls finished facts, all dolorous, all threatening. I read to you a version from the AA book of an alcoholic sick soul. For most normal folks, drinking means conviviality, companionship, colorful imagination, joyous intimacy. But not so with us in the last days of heavy drinking. The old pleasures were gone, they were but memories. Never could we recapture the great moments of the past. There was an insistent yearning to enjoy life as we once did, and then there was heartbreak. Always one more attempt and one more failure. The less people tolerated us, the more we withdrew from society, from life itself. As we became subjects of King Alcohol's shivering denizens of his mad realm, the chilling vapor that is loneliness settled down, it thickened, never becoming blacker. Some of us sought out sordid places, hoping to find understanding, companionship, and approval. Momentarily, we did, there would come oblivion and the awful awakening to face the hideous four horsemen, terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. And then, our alcoholic cannot picture life without alcohol. He can't picture life with alcohol. And then he will know loneliness such as few do. He will be the jumping off place. He will wish for the end. In the end, he will do, directly by suicide, indirectly by death, from alcohol poison, or covertly by alcoholically induced accident. This text, without missing a beat, could have been included among those that James selects for the sick soul. And there are hundreds more of these stories, these accounts of living at the bottom or living death, so to speak. Now, as he detailed earlier, we know that James spent time in the darkness. We know as well that he announced a turn that was to become a way out for him namely a self-propelling act of the will which he said, to be sure, cannot be optimistic, but can posit, that's the word he uses, to shift, a shift, to shift the site by which we carry on. Herein we have the relocation, that's both James's and Jung's work, uh, the inner life discussed in the sixth soul, and the rearrangement he discussed in a certain blindness, whereby our self is riven, he says. Our self is riven, 
and its narrow interests fly to pieces, then a new center, a new perspective must be found. So too is this the centerpiece of Jung's counsel to his hopeless, hapless, alcoholic patient, namely the need for, this is Jung, a huge emotional displacement under the press of a vital spiritual experience. And for me, this is the turn call for in the AA chapter, how it works. We stood at the turning point. Now, all of this is comparably well known by students of William James, especially by reflective, long-suffering, uh, low-bottom alcoholics. It is also well known that the program of Alcoholics Anonymous provides us with a way out of the darkness subsequent to the turn is made by our innermost self. What is less well known, however, is that the philosophical ruminations of occasional contentions in the work of William James is also a way out of the darkness. Further, this way of James does not, I repeat, does not entail the necessity of certitude, nor does it entail the assumption or the need for ultimate intelligibility. Nor must one have a transcendent source of power to credential either one's beliefs or one's actions. Rather, by their fruit you shall know them, and the proof is in the pudding. Not that James rules these days erratum out of court, but plurals that he is more than one way, more than one way of a way as a player. But he does, this is very important, hold that none of these finalities are sufficiently grounded experientially, and they can be, indeed have been, an obstacle to human flourishing. Now, we have a number of paths that take on the thought of James that would be salutary for amelioration of the alcoholic sick soul. We could, for example, track his concern for blindness, which in this situation I do not register as moral blindness, but as experiential blindness. The correlate here for the alcoholic sick soul is a double denial. First, that something is awry with me, and second, my denial by deflection of the messages given to me, both as warnings and for the possibility of help. We could also probe his many writings on the human will, especially his contention that our will could be an actor. A knowing actor, and not simply a carrier of waters from our minds, which for the alcoholic sick soul are relatively deranged. The issue at stake here is that the alcoholic sick soul has no willpower, for the grip of addiction strips us of the capacity to act in a traditional manner, that is changing, stopping, starting fresh. The incontinence of our will, as discussed by Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, perceptive as that may be, does not face up to the shocking contention of the book that self-knowledge avails us nothing. Self-deception as a metaphor, as a phenomenon, does not show up in James as such. Subtly, however, is a Jamesian message for he holds that nothing is so until the consequences show their hand. No practicing alcoholic wants to hear that. Yet new issue is more paramount in the early stages of recovery, for as we survey the wreckage of our past, the AA phrase, we are utterly astonished and chagrined at the harm we have caused and at the looming chasm between our self-knowledge and our action. William James teaches us that if the relationship between knowing and action is characterized by a flaccid will, be that due to madness, despair, or addiction, then we are cut off from possibility, from chance, and from recovery. For practicing alcoholics, this is not a welcome lesson, for he or she cannot face the consequences when the upshot of that is to make the turn now. We could also track James's voluntarism through his many discussions on the powers and energies of men. At first glance, the significance of these writings of the alcoholic sick soul is immediate. For the first half of the first step reads, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, by the way, in our innermost self is required. James is fascinated with personal energy and with a rending of the nature of willpower. But I read these essays as compensatory, as congenital, and epigenic, epigenetic neurasthenic self working here, as well as the behavioral strand in James's stream. Not only were Freud and Jung his descendants, so too were John Watson and B.F. Skinner. There's work to be done here, but I'll do something else. For me, helpful the way out, but a sick soul, alcoholic or otherwise, is his bequest of radical empiricism, broadly construed. Begun at least as early as essay on some emissions of introspective psychology in 1884, continuing through the chapter of the stream of thought in 1890s, remarks in the preface of the will to believe in 97, the essays of 1904 and 1906, and the final statement in the preface of the meaning of truth in 1909, to the informed reader other instances abound. The irreducible kernel of James's radical empiricism, first we're only going to discuss those experience, uh, our experiences and only that. Uh, as of today, that means that uh, the chatter of six billion human beings, he writes in a will to believe that as long as there's a person, ethics, physics, whatever, someplace, I like to think of as a person in a basement someplace who has something to say, the final word cannot be said. 
Second is a fact, and philosophically this is very contentious, but Lambert and I agree on the importance of this. It is a fact, in the New York City jargon of my childhood, this is a true fact. A fact that relations between things conjunctive as well as disjunctive hold together from next to next by relations that are themselves parts of experience. So we have an equivalently affective experience of A and D and cold, of B, U, T, but, and hot. Everything is tactile. Everything is leaking, being, holding, hugging, running off, flotsaming, jetsaming, spinning on its off. Keynes anticipated uh, sense psychology. He says only 10% comes in, that's all we let in. Just 10%, everything we keep out. We can talk about that. And a generalized conclusion, which I've already given you in another way, is that our stream of experience is concatenatedly knit from within. It does not even extraneous trans-empirical connective support from any source, no matter how benighted. Riding beneath this description of radical empiricism are his assumptions, interest-bearing organisms, welcoming, rejecting, and choosing from the interminable eventing cascades over us, around us, under us, through us. Crucial also is his view that consciousness has a friend as well as a focus. Now this Jamesian personscape provides us with a rich deposit from the for the making of a philosophical anthropology. Today, I reach for but one fallout, one upshot, one message. Then I find help here for the recovering of a sick soul, particularly the alcoholic sick soul. The experience of despair is a constant presence in James' reportage of the sick soul. Historically, Roman Catholic theology have always taught that the two worst sins are despair and presumption. Uh, the psychological terminology of depression and so on and so on is not what I'm up to here. I think that all these issues are philosophical. I mean, I'm not against what the psychologists say, but the abandonment of these issues by the philosophers is a very serious lack. Because if you go to the ancients, I mean, if you go to the Stoics and to the Epicureans, you talk about this all the time. Right. So, now certainly despair is undergone by the low bottom alcoholic, but the nomenclature is tellingly different. Namely, we experience unyielding systemic loneliness. In the book of AA, lonesome, alone, and lonely are the most frequent, frequent diagnostic words. They just keep showing up over and over and over. If you begin an AA meeting with 15 recovering alcoholics of varying length and sobriety, age, gender, race, class, occupation, profession, profession, and say, okay, let's talk about loneliness, invariably, you will witness an outpouring of admission that loneliness was unbearable, a loneliness known as few do. Now, what does the radical periods of James have to do with this? For James, loneliness obviously is a disconnection. I reach, but I do not touch. With Heraclitus, the Logos speaks, but I don't hear. Febrile texture turns to straw. The world of experience turns shabby, and I myself become shabby. Contrary to the poet Hopkins, there's no freshness deep down things. Nay, there's no freshness, no deep, nowhere, no how. My world is stripped of contours, edges, rivulets, bypasses, signings, and above all horizons. I'm locked up inside my sick soul, inside my addiction, and I experience the utter hopelessness as early expressed by Tolstoy at James' and sick soul. But now entering into the process of recovering, assuming here a turn, a James in willingness, not a conversion, a need to be fed, quick and very slow. The quick is bringing possibility back into life. James tells us that we experience separateness to the end. Forget about temporal finality. We ain't going to get this together, no matter what they say. Ambiguity, tie chasm, chance, those are ontological. I mean, they're not just something we're going to straighten out. But he also tells us that separateness, disconnection, is a continuous transition. He's going to tell us that your disconnection, that your loneliness, is also a continuous transition. This means that my loneliness, stark and searing as it may be, is continuous with the flow of my experience and is potentially open to messages from whomever, whatever, wherever, especially those from the fringe of the speaking stream. 
To be a sick soul, to be a drunk, an alcoholic, an addict, a thief cannot be captured by a label. And it cannot be diagnosed as a personal state, a type, an object, a subject, or any other nomination that reflects what James calls a block universe, or what James refers to as a brickbat plan of construction. To be a sick soul is a process. We are souls who are sicking. Such a spiritual nutrition needed to sustain a turning is blocked from our seeing, our hearing, our touching, our feeling. In a line from the Vanilla Fudge of Rock Blue but the 60, I wish I could see what my eyes see. Spiritual inanition is our lot, our trap. Yet all may not be lost. James has counseled us that separateness, loneliness is a continuous transition. With what, we ask? With the French, with the more, with the fact, James again, can be no difference anywhere that doesn't make a difference elsewhere. Surely our explicit situation is dreadful. We must turn to the implicitness, both awash and hidden in everything, everywhere. In radical empiricism, James writes, our fields of experience have no more definite boundaries than have our fields of view. Both are fringed forever by a more that continuously develops, continuously supersedes them as life proceeds. He is not telling us that our abject loneliness should reach out for a more, a relational buzz. That kind of pedagogy does not work. Hey, look at that. You're so lucky. You have this. Go there. Do that. Doesn't work. No, he's telling us that our loneliness has its own more. This is so profound like a cry. And it's not that you get out of the loneliness of some more. It's that the loneliness has everything has its more. To have this more, look to the edge. Follow the relational transitions, however spare, however pale. This is the slope. More than likely, nutrition, if ever so slight, will show its hand. So, this is from James again, from Radical Pearson. Experience itself taken at large can grow by its edges. Just take that line along. Experience at large, right? Taken by itself can grow by its edges. That one moment proliferates into the next by transitions which, whether conjunctive or disjunctive, continue the experiential tradition. Can't deny that, he says. Here's another line. Life is in the transition as much as in the terms connected. Turn that to the business of the goal, as if sobriety were like a thing or a state. It's not. It's a process. Now, the second promise given to recovering alcoholics is that we will not regret the past and wish to shut the door on it. All of our experiencing speak, not only to us, but within the stream itself. And how is that possible? Now listen to this line from James, Mirabile, Dicta, Woy, right? He says, our experiences are cognitive of one another. Like we say in Tonga, the kingdom of Tonga, that's a expensive time. I tell you straight away, I believe that. I believe that our experiences are cognitive of one another, that they talk. That's what I believe. They don't need some, right? percepts lead, concepts follow. Percepts lead, concepts follow. It's in the gut. Writes, the knowledge of sensible realities thus comes to life inside the tissue of experience. Loneliness is cut, not abrogated, cut. For we are not spectators looking out at a vast abyss so characteristic of the sick soul. Rather, we are participants in the knowledge of sensibilities, again, James, made and made by relations that unfold themselves I mean, in time. However halting, sparse, bare, this ongoing relational manifold is at the beginning of recovering. It is nonetheless a Jamesian perch in the rush of sensorial makings and unmakings. Following James's knowledge is not that of a bout, as in the conceptual or formulaic, notably characterized between distant self and world. Rather than James, we speak here of knowledge by acquaintance, by direct experience, prehensive, hand over hand. And our loneliness is further ameliorated by the rush of hunches, hints, and surprises as these relations speak to each other and slowly, richly speak to us. See, I believe that the task of pedagogy is to help others to make relations and to read their experiences. The task of pedagogy is not to give somebody something to memorize or it's, to, it's, a, it's a form of liberation. And uh, I'm fortunate because uh, I'm a wounded healer. I was a sick soul. And I want to tell you this, I've never had a student 
who was not so relieved to know that I was a wounded hero. I can't, not one student has ever said, you're just a creep there, you've got a bad history. Never. They are totally taken with the fact that I'm a wounded hero. It just opens the whole thing up. Our loneliness is further ameliorated by the rush of hunch of sense of surprises as these relations speak to each other and slowly, richly speak to us. Contrary to common wisdom, I do not think that in recovery, the amelioration of systemic loneliness occurs in a flash or burning bush, as it were. Rather, it works if you work it. That's the AA line. It's also changed his life. All these people write about pragmatism and make fun of him about the word work. They don't have the damnedest idea what James means by work. It's an American word. <laughs> you know, my father understood completely what it was what that word meant since he was out of work for like 10 years in the 30s. He knew what work meant. Did you get work? Can you have work? Do you have work? Can you work? Just when you talk, talk. That's what he's talking about, work. And, it, and it's in the book, right? Work. It works if you work it. Work. It means to, like, to be able to bring it off. Not for good. Not forever. Right? True. En right. passant. It works if you work it, but if James is onto something, I think he is, and the will to believe in possibility can unlock that frozen sea to so terrifyingly depicted in his chapter on the sick soul. Now, I do not speak here about smelling the roses, although I can be testy about that off-sided quick fix for a deadly molasse. You know. In Germany, you've got to do, you got to smell the roses. So, I mean, I, that didn't go over well with me at all. Okay. No, I point here to pedagogy found initially in this, in, in, in this I mean, August setting at Harvard Divinity School, you see, where, by the way, Ralph Emerson once showed up. <laughs> we don't want to forget that. But uh, in this setting, you see, that um, uh, you will be pleased, I hope, for me to tell you that this James is in this line of pedagogy, the Perifusion of Scotus Eritra, um, the tradition of the Vestigia Dei, uh, as found in the medieval Franciscans, the Victorines, Bonaventure, the image and shadows of divine things of Jonathan Edwards, Horace Bushnell, Emerson on nature, and then James. And not for today, but the capstone of this tradition is the first three chapters of Dewey's Otter's Experience. Now, only semi-canonical, and God knows in philosophy, are you kidding? Where I, you can imagine how far I can get with this stuff in philosophy, right? Only semi-canonical, this tradition embraces a, a, a pedagogy of nutrition, one in which all counts, everything speaks, and although loneliness can never, loneliness can never be absolutely abrogated, we become able to connect it to flourishing. Try that one on. You say, well, am I ever going to get out of this? I don't know what you mean by getting out of this. Okay. But supposing I say if we get at it together, you might be able to connect your loneliness to at least the scent, SC, of flourishing. How's that? What do we call the growth? The turn towards recovering is less than an act of faith, but it's more than an act of hope. Absorbing the message of the famous torch song, perhaps we can say that recovering is taking a chance on love. Now, I'm going to read this whole text here that I wrote a long time ago, but I think I won't do that. I'm just going to talk to you about it for a minute. Um, but 25 years ago, in 1985, I was pretty much systemically drunk all the time, although I carried on. I did everything, you know. The people have funny images of what people, alcoholics and drunks and so on. I just did everything until the last month, and then, of course, I was, they had to read, my children arrested me, to total disaster. But I was doing all kinds of things. But I was just drunk all the time. And I, I was just, you know, one of those guys in, in James's chapter. I mean, it's like, you know. And uh, so I wrote this thing, and it's all about eating the world and making relations. And it's, it's you know, the scriptural rhetorical question, Lord, what, us, what must I do to be saved, can be re-invoked by our children and our students as follows. What shall I do to make a world which is personally mine? As the student said to me, what am I going to do with myself, McDermott? What can I do? This is 1985. What can I do to make a world which is personally mine? Even though it in here is coheres, borrows and lends to others who are making a world personally their own. Couch more indirectly, this is the question our children and our students ask us. The initial response is obvious. Make relations, build, relate, reflect, reflect, relate, build. Seek novelty, leave no stone and turn, fasten and color shapes, textures, sounds, odors, and sights. Never close down. The only acceptable denim was is death until all signs are go. Make relations till the maker is unmade. And watch out for the dangers. 
relation saturation, relation seduction, all that stuff. So I wrote this. Four years later, right, I'm locked up, right, totally out of my mind, deranged and dead. So how do you get from writing this to that? All right. Not only was I unable to make relations, doing making of any kind was impossible. Suicidal. It's impossible, right? Over against, James says, there are possibilities, you know, action, not yet, no present sight. I mean, if somebody had come in to me at that point, he says, I got to tell you something. I got this guy, Bill James, he said, there are possibilities. Next. I said, you know, I get that, right? Yeah. I mean, how do you get from writing this to that, and how do you get from that, right, to where I am now, 21 years later? It's just, one, it's just one guy's story, but it's not one guy's story. It's all kinds of you know, people. Right? Now, not only was I unable to make relations, doing making of any kind was impossible. Note the word impossible. Had I fallen prey to all of the perils articulated me in the essay, I was, I was subject to all the perils that I warned others against. I said, and watch out for this while I'm going under. In fact, truth be told, I was a James in very sick soul, living barely and at that living only a second-hand life. I certainly was not taken by those messages couched in, couch in the bland rhetoric of the higher power, nor was I taken by the suffocating omnipresence of moral and cultural expectations. McDermott straightened up. The first increased my second-handedness, and the second seemed to come from egregious moral self-righteousness. But I had not forgotten the pedagogy of William James. I clung to his affirmation of the possibility of possibility. And my clinging to it was a spiritual, experiential, rather than an epistemological cling. You say, huh? You understand? In other words, I, I clung to it because, I mean, it, it had to do with eating. I mean, you know, eating experience, nutrition and initiation, starving to death, just totally lost. It had, had to do with that kind of clinging, not the clinging of clarity. Now, did not James tell me that nothing's been concluded? What has been concluded? He said it's been concluded. And the possibilities were extant, not yet in your present sight. What he really said to me is, you're not finished yet, McDermott, you know, it's not over yet. Is that over yet? And did he not warn me that these messagings from the fringe could not be packaged conceptually, for they will go limp? Read that as a critique of a whole lot of contemporary philosophy. Messagings from the fringe cannot be packaged conceptually. They'll go limp. And so too did he say that such messagings were averse to clarity, even though it would be intelligible and meaningful. Intelligibility does not require clarity. Love and hate and sadness are not clear, but they're sure as hell intelligible. William James's mantra, ever not quite, but so, became my own. I close here with a line from Walt Whitman. It's very important to me. The press of my foot to the earth springs a hundred affections. They scorn the best I can do to relate them. Yeah, it is nutrition. But it's never enough. Although it deepens with each other, these affections which spring. Notice it's my foot. Whitman's a foot guy. Hopkins is a foot guy. Feet guy, right? It's an eye guy. I'm not an eye guy. I'm a hands guy. Feet guy. I'm an earth guy. My naturalist, right? Yeah. Wow. But loss is involved always. Although it deep odds with each other, these profound messages of Whitman hold together en passant in a Jamesian radically empirical person's case. On behalf of that coincidencia oppositorum, from Nicholas Cusanus to William James, it's a coincidencia oppositorum. I try to live my life while recovering from the sickness of my soul. Thank you. Well, wow. 
it falls to David Lamberth to be the first respondent to this most extraordinary presentation. For those of you who do not know David, he's a professor of philosophy and theology here at Harvard Divinity School. Uh, he is eminently prepared to speak on this topic of William James, and I know that uh, these two have been friends and colleagues for a long time, and this will not be the first time uh, that you have exchanged with each other. Um, I could tell you lots of things about David. Let me just very quickly say uh, that he has written many things about William James. Uh, William James and the Metaphysics of Experience. He is the editor of James and Joyce Reconsidered, Reflections on the Centenary of Pragmatism. He is currently deeply involved in two projects, one on religion, a pragmatic approach, and another on William James for the Rutledge Philosophers series. Uh, David might have more time to spend on these projects uh, were he not uh, deeply involved in a project here uh, with the University Library Implementation Work Group, working with all 73 of Harvard's libraries, uh, but still time to be deeply involved and interested in issues of pragmatism and certainly William James. So, uh, David, thank you for being our first respondent today, and I would ask if maybe uh, afterwards you could field questions for the both of you if you're willing to do that. Thank you, David. I want to begin with a word of deep thanks to John J. McDermott for this year's William James Lecture on Religious Experience just offered. He notes in his opening remarks that this is an unconventional lecture of sorts, um, but one that William James himself might have approved of. I can't really presume to speak for James, though I suspect he probably would have approved. Um, but I can attest myself to the value of the lecture of the witness just offered and say a word of thanks for it. I've been in this room a number of times uh, for named and invited lectures over the last 13 years at HDS. Um, in fact, uh, for virtually all the William James lectures on religious experience as well. And we frequently, uh, quite frequently I should say, had a questioner among us who shot up a hand as the first hand up and then began to interrogate the invited uh, speaker as to whether they themselves had had any religious experience to back what they were saying, and whether, whether anything they themselves had to say could be attested to or witnessed to by real experience, point being to call out those of us who are academics. With no comment on the prior lectures intended, I would suggest that today that question could be only asked by one who slept through the lecture. And I should note that McDermott's a rather hard lecturer to sleep through given the rise and fall in the tone and volume of his delivery. John, it takes a great deal of integrity and exemplary moral courage to speak from both the mind and the heart as you have today to attest truly from within, within the realm of the stream of experience of your own life, and we're honored today by your being willing to do that. Professor McDermott is indeed a friend of mine, one actually relatively newly acquired around five years ago, but one whom I appreciate deeply. He asked me after he was invited to lecture uh, here uh, for this lecture about what I thought he might talk about. <clears throat> And I suggested that he might elaborate on a comment I heard him make once about his own understanding of the need for an awakening of secular spirituality. What we have today is both a more particular address in certain respects, um, but at the same time, if you're reading closely or listening closely, a full delivery on that account of the bases for secular spirituality if one follows out all its ramifications. By that I mean that what we have uh, worked out for us today is how to understand uh, in the narrow sense what James calls the process of conversion, in this case from the depths of alcoholic degeneration, but also how to understand the ordinary and the extraordinary cases of human transformation from the perspective of a naturalistic view on reality. 
James himself in vi varieties, in particular, is ambivalent. He's often himself inclined simply to hearken to the religious in the more traditional sense. And in a way, it's true that most of his examples in the text orient that way. But any reader who's actually paying attention also finds themselves disturbed by the breadth of James's conception of religion by the fact that it doesn't hew so narrowly after all. In the first half of the text, at least, what we have is a study in human transformation, an ordinary challenge in human life, one that James notes, by the way, is typical, that is, the need for transformation of <clears throat> adolescence, um, but that also presents itself later in life for many extraordinarily. McDermott's own life examples give us a vector on that and provide a novel perspective on the range of options for life that James's philosophy uncovers and that is understanding of humanity uh, in its complexity chart as within the range of the possible. Traditional conversions are indeed one kind of this sort of transformation and perhaps the most frequently attended to or celebrated. But other ways out exist too not only from imbibing in things like healthy mindedness, something James himself attends extensively to and takes quite seriously, but also from figuring out how to transform the six old experience out of almost nothing, how to take the experience of a self divided and work it out of its own meager resources into a more livable life. Notably, James is explicit in the varieties that religion, uh, understood from the point of view of that text, is a subset uh, of human experience itself, here instantiating the principle of radical empiricism that only those things defined in terms of experience uh, shall be under consideration. Seeing religious emotions, for example, as ordinary emotions typified by a religious object and he marks this in addition to explaining it at the opening by subtitling the book, not a study in religiosity or a study in religious transformation or God forbid, a study in mysticism, but rather calling it instead a study in human nature. McDermott leaves us to contemplate the traditionally religious approaches on our own today, but beside them, he charts the ameliorative effects available out of the interstices of experience themselves to all of us, the naturalist as well. And importantly, he indicates clearly that the hint of voluntarism, that interstitial uh, remnant that offers hope of a salutary connection, isn't easily found when it's most needed, nor is it immediately rewarding. That hint, instead, is hard to discriminate in the fringe and hard to realize in life. But the under, underlying connectedness uh, which James points us to is still there in our most alone moments and McDermott's own account, indeed his very presence today, 21 years later, testify not only to its possibility but to its possible realization. Such possibility isn't a certainty as any of us who have lived close to alcohol, alcoholism much less uh, been subject to it, know so well. Now McDermott gives us the inside view on this and truthfully I can't begin to add to that so much as to point to it and say pay close attention. But I can note something from the outside, something cautionary but also crucially instructive. In talking about this experience, McDermott notes in passing that the aloneness is not merely a perception of the alcoholic, but also a product of their behavior and belief. It's not simply the as if of James remembering the French asylum patient, but rather it's the for real pushing away and the acceptance of being pushed away that results from the low bottom alcoholics certainty of their own self perception. Key to this, however, is that all of the friends and the relations and the compatriots must also throw in the towel. Giving up, 
taking the bottom for the alcoholic is too much for them to bear, and thus breaking off themselves from the fringe. This creates the objective aloneness that, frankly, often doesn't go the way that yours did, John. In Varieties, James notes that such cases of the non-alcoholic sort can often be resolved through religion, through powers that seem to come from without, even far without, coming from the transcendent domain. If you are religious or open to religion, that solution may be palatable. But for the naturalist, the convicted naturalist, it leaves little nourishment for any faint hope that he or she uh, might find. Sociality, friendship, mere recognition of the humanity of the lowest of the low among us could itself contribute to that thread on the fringe that makes the glimmer of hope enough to nourish relations that establish themselves. Not only formal religion has a role in this, that's one of the big takeaways of this, and one of the big takeaways, I think, of the contestation that John offers um, about the role of the higher power in AA and the big book. Not only formal religion has a role here in such incremental transformations, but mere humanity as well. And we're all on the hook for that. Now this is borne out not only in the short run, but also in the long run. Recent empirical studies have shown that the best chance of extending sobriety for those who subject themselves to 12-step programs correlates not only with attending meetings, but distinctively one's success is uh, almost doubled by becoming a sponsor of someone else, by committing to that connection and making oneself the subject of dependence, creating an interstitial bond that is objective to both with grips in both directions. James himself knew as much both in his own notions about humanity and even in his theological moments where he conceived that not only are we dependent on God, but God is dependent upon us too. The sick soul is one of the deepest and most revealing of human conditions from James's point of view. It ends uh, or leads into the, to the culmination of his movement into conversion uh, transiting from the sick soul as the deepest perception about, and most comprehensive perception about reality to the prospects for um, some kind of resolution to it in the form of the, di the divided self um, and its reunitement in conversion. I think that the mapping today of the concrete experience of alcoholism onto this illuminates the human condition we're all subject to equally well. McDermott shows us James as a resource here for understanding what our nature is and for the possibilities that inhere within that, um, which we may ourselves find need to see along our own way. Thanks, John, for the talk, for the possibilities that it models and promises, and for the intellectual nourishment. It's somewhat more than a napkin, but offered uh, in the same spirit. So I'd be happy to recognize questions for uh, Professor McDermott and John. I'm probably going to drag you up here as we uh, have them. I can't hear you. Sir. I'll talk louder. I'll come, I'll come closer. I was wondering 
wondering whether in James's understanding of the process, whether to use the category secular spirituality is the kind of setup of dichotomy between a naturalistic and a secular spirituality. And it, it might seem to be that, that in James's philosophy, there are elements that might overcome that kind of a division. I agree with you completely, and I didn't, uh, I, uh, this, but it's not true of Dewey. So, so, in other words, you caught me out here. I mean, I'm, uh, on this stuff you're talking about, I'm doing. And uh, so let me just give you a couple of autobiographical things. Uh, the confessional Roman Catholic, 30 years, daily communicant. And uh, very, very active in the, uh, in the politics of the church. I'm one of the members of the uh, totally unsung Catholic left. The uh, 40s, 50s, 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 50s. Yeah, uh, fellow traveler. So, and so I come out of the uh, St. Meinrad and all right, I mean, all the liturgy, the whole, you know, thing, you see, hours of the day, so on. And um, so I, how about this, Professor Grant? My sense of so-called historical religion, religious sensibility, I think, is richer than James's. <laughs> you, you, you see? Okay. So, uh, so your point is really well taken, but now what I want to say is, I mean, this is a phrase, I don't know if you're calling on this, but what I mean is that I don't think the term religare, which as you know means to be bound up, not to be ontologically isolated. So, mm -hmm. so I remember that he's in that sense because I do believe that we are ontologically distant. I mean, that I think about. That I mean, that, in other words, I, I, I don't think that we were, that things went well and then they went bad. I think they didn't make any sense. In the but, uh, but, but this binding is. Um, multi uh, funded and filled with, with, with serious dangers. And uh, so you say that James has a way of dealing with the religious question uh, deeply without having to invoke a secular spiritual. And I agree with that. Um, and, uh, so then I say that I see this more like Dewey's experience of nature. But why am I talking about James here? Because uh, James has this exquisite phenomenological diagnostic ability to talk about single persons. And so that I, I, I find in him a neighbor. I find in him someone that I think is just like, well, my friendship with David, I mean, just like that. Whereas with Dewey, I mean, it's a very imposing kind of relationship. <laughs> 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 it has more to do with people, knowing a whole lot of things. <laughs> so, you're right on the, you're right on the mark. Um, I, I, uh, I, I think, you see, that it's a price to be paid for no ultimate intelligibility, no ultimate transcendence. And the price is um, a tremendous sense of liberation and ontological depression. I mean, the upshot of Copernicanism is, uh, Randall made this point many years ago, is that on the one hand, yeah. it's the infinite space which terrifies me, Pascal, oh my God. And the other one is, well, you know, let's see what we can do to make something up with ourselves. And they always go again, you see. So uh, I hope I don't take communion on my deathbed like Voltaire. I mean, I can't say I won't, but you know, I, I, but, but I, I, I decided uh, quite a long time ago to say, OK, I'm going to own up to this. Now, it's not that I know what, what 
what's up. I don't know what's up. All I know is how I'm living. And the, um, the, the thing about my alcoholism, which is still with me, obviously, never goes away. And, uh, you know, it's the only sickness, illness, whatever you want to call it, that a person wants to do again. <laughs> Cancer patient, remission, diabetic, whatever, does not want to do that again. Those are so hardcore, want to do it again, like tonight. You know, really. I mean, I want to do it all the time. Every day, I want to do it again. You see. Now, why would I possibly want to do that again? Well, that's part of this terrain that James is fascinated by, that I'm fascinated by. It's a terrain that is not open to rational discussion. It's, it's a terrain which is, it's not the Mysterium Tremendum, and it's not the Numens, okay, in the great history of religion, but it sure as hell Mysterium Tremendum for me. Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, for my God. Okay? And the, uh, and as you well know, the chances of recovery are so slight. Uh, the person who started with me on July 10th of 1989, there's less than half of 1% who have been continuously sober. And for those who come in and out and so on, that may be 10%. I mean, it's just a startling kind of, 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 of illness that I mean, you can break out. And yet at the same time, the signature is that thousands of meetings, I go all the time, thousands of meetings, many thousands of alcoholics, but now many addicts is that the signature is so clear that I mean, when James writes about the sick soul, you know, when these folks just come in and start talking, it's, the signature is clear. This, this is a sickness which is, you know, vaporing. And so it's not enough to say, well, I won't go to the bar, or I, I mean, I'll get a divorce, or I'll quit my job, or whatever the hell it is. None of those things do it. They may be necessary, by the way, you know, as part of it, but they don't do it. The only thing that does it is to face up to the fact that, you know, that this is the kind of person I am and no way out. There's only, there's no way out. The only thing I can do is what he suggests, James, is that within, believe me, within the utter, within the utter badness and sadness of my own self, um, there's money. There is some money. There's some extra. So, it depends on to whom I'm speaking, sir. There are certain persons who are village atheists and that whole crowd, I refer to this as religious sensibility. <laughs> I mean, there, there are others, you see, who think that, you know, religion will solve my problem, but then I don't speak, I speak in a very different way. You understand. Go ahead. Professor. Sorry to cause you so much trouble, Mr. <laughs> Tech. Right. I, I find it curious that you uh, you said you're not an eye guy, you're a hand and a foot right. guy, right? But uh, it seems you're even more a mouth guy. Excuse me? A mouth guy. You, you talk about eating the world and it's yeah. in the gut, right? And relation starvation. Right, right. Really yeah, I'm a, yeah, that's right. And so when That's you, really him, what I mean by hand. Yeah, yeah, Feeding it, yeah. 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 Um, and so when you say that, I mean, it, you know, obviously the difference is, you know, one, you're not a spectator, the other, you're, you're incorporating, you know, you're making part of yourself. And I started thinking about Kant in the uh, Doctrine of Virtue, where he says to be a friend, you not only have to love, but you also have to respect, because love envelops, and love includes, and love consumes, but respect requires disjunct, right? And as, as we all know in James, it's not just the conjunct, it's the disjunct. Not just conjunctive relationships, but disjunctive relationships. So I'm curious. You've spoken so much about eating and, and joining and relating in that way, but what role do, do do disjunctive relationships play for the the sick soul who's recovering? Well, I mean, one, one form of eating is drinking a lot of whiskey, and that causes a lot of trouble, right? I mean, uh, see, the body is an ova. I don't ever talk about mind and body ever. Uh, I think there's, we don't have the word for it. You know, Spinoza had uh, two substances, but he thought maybe it was a third one. We call him person, uh, me and you. you know, I mean, there's, I mean, 
How the animals do this is utterly fascinating. The stuff that's been coming up with the bugs all the time. But I don't know how, I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know. But I do know that, uh, I do know that how, how I'm in the world is messaging all the time. And I never think about it like thinking. And then one of these guys who like thinks about something. <laughs> so, so that, that, um, uh, and the whole world of the drug, I mean, going all the way back from the beginning, right? I mean, the herbs and the whole history and stuff. Whole cultures living on this. I mean, the, the Shoshone living on peyote thousand years. We brought them some Jack Daniels. They went totally nuts, right? Huh? And but we and we can't handle peyote. It's all and it's off. It's really fascinating. But uh, James is right that I'm not I'm, I'm not a Lego, I'm not a butt in a box. I mean I'm right, continuous. Um, and then you see he's wise to say that in this continuity there's also disconnection. And the disconnection shows up when we say that's not good for me. <coughs> That doesn't work for me. That won't work for me. You see, so you say to me now, we leave here, and you say, "Let's go get a whiskey, McDermott." Right? And I have to say to you, "I'm pleased by the invitation. I would love to do it." And I have to say to you, "That won't work for me." But what does that mean? It means that the relational manifold, which is McDermott, right, has all this stuff in it that just goes totally bonkers when. I do that. But it doesn't go bonkers when Dean does it. But there are other things that make you bonkers. <laughs> okay. So uh, the, the, the task then, you see, is to learn how, I say, to learn how to read our experiences, I mean, uh, to make relations and so on. And um, uh, this is why, you see, literature is, I mean, you know, the, the history of literature is filled with all these diagnostic moments. Right. brilliantly given to us without any of the lattice work of the philosophers or the theologians or anybody else. So in Long Day's Journey and Tonight, we've got two drunks and an act, and then a guy with tuberculosis. Right. And uh, so there it is. You've got a culture, the Irish culture. You've got a low middle class culture and a theatrical culture. You've got the culture of cozy, culture of misfortune, hotel God. We got all this stuff. And and so that when we do this together with my students, it was like, so then if I talk philosophically about ontological disconnection, or about sadness, or about Changing one's mind, yeah. so um, there's a touchstone. There. Now the I thing is that I mean, obviously, uh, I, I, I mean, obviously, you, you know it. I'm not saying that in the whole history of vision. Seventeenth century is the century of vision. Not take off another century of vision. Well, 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 what I'm saying is that. See, the eyes are really like all the other organs that they, they, uh, you don't only see what you're seeing, you know, I mean, so it's all that. But you say, the thing that fascinates me is the absence of distance in, uh, in, uh, in the body through the world. And the distance in seeing is really not there, but that's what we say there is. So the whole notion of the other and so on. So it's very, very, very deep and, you know, and very, very you know. Long. But uh, loneliness, or what they now call depression, uh, I didn't care much for starting this book. I thought it was too uh, self indulgent. I didn't like it much. The title is absolutely exquisite. Visible darkness. That's the title. I, that's exactly it. I've been there. I know what that is. Right? And visible darkness, you know, say, is, is the way I would talk about the eyes. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah, right. And it's just like, I mean, it's like everywhere. <coughs> it seems like everywhere. And the, the thing about depression, what I do about the loneliness and so on, is that 
Where is it? You know, say, what hurts? Like, where is it? And it's nowhere. It, it, it's this way in which we human beings are in the world. So, uh, and, and for which, there, from my point of view, from which there is no way out, but, but the way in is, a, is, I think, all we can ask. And if James is right, we get a whole lot from that, you know, more than we might <coughs> expect. And then he's also right, and this I believe. If you start fooling with the transcendent, you've got to be very careful about seduction. <laughs> Quite aside from whether there is such a thing, I don't want to get to that. But you've got to be very careful with that. You see. And so for many people, their recovery is dependent on the higher power. If at any time the higher power lets them down by their own, right, they don't make it. You've got to be very careful about you know, being dependent on anyone else for your sobriety or for you know, whatever. You know, isn't it? And so, uh, so then they say, well, this is a rank you know, existential individual, whatever you want to call it, right? I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, but yeah, right. I mean, that's, that's yeah, that's okay. <laughs> because uh, actually, the fact that I'm unconscious is this condition, as Mark told me, certainly. Huh? You know, I mean, he's right about that. I'm a little guy. I'm white. I don't know urban. You know, male. I mean, all this stuff, yeah. Right. Son of a camel, and all that stuff. But my point is, who is undergoing these conditions? Me! And so that's not the whole story. But people keep telling the story following the social sciences. <laughs> and abduction of science, which is back now on the table, believe it or not. I'm telling the story, and there ain't no me there. So, I mean, that's, there's a lot more to do about that. <laughs> Could you speak up, sir? Sure. Say about it too, good. Well, I mean, it, it's an interesting point, right? I, it would, and and uh, Professor McDermott's focus on the, on the individuality and kind of the role of the central role that individuality plays for James is is relevant to coordinate with this, right? If you look in the mysticism chapters, where James talks about it, it the the most extreme version of the experiences you're talking about, there's a before and an after. And the before and the after is a bit like the, the experience he talks about in the principles of psychology when he talks about the consciousness of self, where he notes that when you go to sleep at night, you wake up the next morning, it, if you're sleeping in a room with somebody else, you wake up in the morning with your dreams and your memories, and they wake up with theirs. 
right? So the, the, this, the, the religious casting of the experience of complete conjunction happens in a broader frame, which is not a frame of complete conjunction, because the experience of identity is the experience in part of how far you extend, but it's also the experience of where you don't, right? Of where it's something other than what you are. So uh, James, I, I, I mean, I actually take James to be, you know, if you wanted to push onto the question of what's at bottom, I think James is going to say uh, disjunction is as fundamental as conjunction. The problem is that the philosophical tradition has made disjunction the norm, and conjunction has required explanation, right? So he's, he's making a situational correction. Hume's concerns over how you get causality to function and how you make that work uh, conceptually are involved in that. I mean, the other thing I'd say is there's a great deal of satisfaction to disjunction, right? Um, which is to say a lot of times we postulate that uh, there's, a, there's a gap here between this bottle of water and the table. They're actually disjunct, and therefore I can pick it up, right? So there's a satisfaction in picking that up. I dare say, I don't really want to speak for him, but I'll toss it out there and then hand it over to you. But my guess is that there's a satisfaction in the disjunction that's involved in saying no to the craving to say yes to this guy's offer for a glass of whiskey, right? I mean, there's a satisfaction there as well as a dissatisfaction. And those two things are coeval. Human beings may be about flourishing, but flourishing is an amalgam of meaningful satisfactions and dissatisfactions. So? Uh so if I get you right, I mean, uh, you know, he has this essay called How Two Minds Know One Thing, and they don't, but they, but they have to, I mean, how we carry on. So this, this is the pragmatic term that, uh, you know, we made a deal, gesture, language, all kinds of stuff, that thing, so. so there is a sense, there is a sense in which I'm alone, but he is dead set against any form of atomism because he believes we're permeable, as I do. The word I use is a uterine. In other words, that everything is like moving through us, and so that we are not a solid, I'm not a solid. And there are many ways in which I can have access to you and you to me. Many, many, many ways. One of them is linguistically here. Another is the, the cut of your gym uh, or your sensibilities, uh, your history. That is, somebody said, watch out for that. that and all of that. Now, um, uh, it's hard, uh, you know, it's hard to be ontological alone because there's no rescue. I don't believe there's a rescue of any kind. I don't know. And ineffability is in many ways a mask for rescue. <laughs> you see? And as a matter of fact, Virtually all religious traditions are involved in some form of a rescue. And one of the really uh, unfortunate, that's a euphemism, is that we don't take the responsibility we should that this whole disaster of the history of the human race is our fault. I see this as a responsible for all. So, uh, uh, as long as I think, you know, there's another game, I, again, I don't really pay attention to what I have to do. And uh, intoxicants from whatever source right, enable me to live for a long time without taking any responsibility. So, but I worry about any other game until I go crashing down. So, uh, uh, really, very hard.
only phrases uh, which have no purchase in the intellectual life, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Doing a, you know, doing better, best I can do. Yeah. Elliot's famous thing about trying, it's the only thing that's our business. And all those kind of phrases, right? Which really are not taken. You know, and the university now has become totally insane about uh, prominence. Right? Everything has to be right? now, totally lost the sense of the hard carrier, the worker. You know, man, totally lost the sense. We had a new a guy rising to be a dean. He said, "Well, everybody be prominent." These eyes which radical obsolescence. You know, have you noticed this? The more we're talking about, you know, fame and money and stuff, the more obsoleting we do. Yeah. I mean, it's just good. And uh, all the really first rate intellectual presences in my life, in the fifties and sixties, their name is not pronounced at home, they're gone, except by our kindness and the dean. They're not part of the conversation. You know, respect and so on. See, it's really a, a, a powerfully ugly paradox. <laughs> so, um, my position is, you see, you celebrate the things of time because that's all there is. And that those who've gone before me, you see, are bedding, you know. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're like Whitman says. I mean, they're the uncut here of the dead. And, 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 and that's it. And that's what I meant, you see, what I said. I'm a big guy. Right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I got exactly what you're up to there, but I, I, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, you use the word inevitable. Here's, here's a James thing that not many people go. William James wrote very interestingly about archivalism and the principles and so on. But he, he, he didn't know what the hell to do with his brother, who was uh, uh, well bothered by brother in this town. Picked up off the street all the time. And of course, only had access to this stuff. The in New York Times last week had a big thing about Belladonna and the, you know, the, the old thing. And uh, you know what they'll do? And don't go crazy. It was embarrassing, you know, says that. Henry did not have the same response. Even though Henry was kind of fake, blah, 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 he did not have the same response. And there's a line in Henry James with that chair that said, Robinson is uh, ineffable. That's what he said. He said that. Now, wow, right? I mean, what does that mean? It's palpable, but it ain't explainable. <laughs> it's all there, but who the hell knows what that means? <laughs> right? And so, the only persons then who can articulate that is the guys who, like, in the 1930s got together, all hardcore drugs, all relaxed, done zillions of times. Right. And you got, you got Vermont sensibility, con congregational ethos, covenanting. You got the American can do thing, remember, pragmatic you know, sensibility, right? You got a dose of James' stuff in there and so on. And this book is a mock-up. Because, watch out for this. This will be okay. Yeah, you'll find this better. Oh, don't do that. Right, right, right. All written by persons who write, you know, with that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, as you probably know, Bill Wilson punched out his male nurse when he was dying, demanding a bottle of whiskey. After 40 years. The number one guy, right? The number one guy, you see, right? Completely understandable to me. Uh, if I would have had to give it to her, frankly. You know, because, I mean, like, well, what, what is this? I mean, you know, so. <laughs> um, well, take alcoholism now, if I may, as a name for the human condition. I mean, it opens up the frontal lobe. It enables you to do and say things like you ordinarily would not be able to do, right? Will you dance with me, right? I mean, all kinds of people, right? Do all these kinds of things, right? 
And then in time, of course, you're just a chattering idiot. You just no. no. Doesn't that sound a lot like human history? <laughs> huh? Yeah. No? I mean, and uh, and doesn't it sound a lot like what's happening in contemporary America, if I may? Where these zero values or in all this we get in trash right in front of our eyes all these going on. Anyway, um, I think uh, too much of whatever. So. Oh, uh, that's enough of that, yeah. So, are we over time? Or are we, you know, we can maybe take one more quick question. I mean, no questions are quick, but it's okay. Not with us up here. Yeah, no, quite. Okay. Thanks for coming. Yeah.